A lot of folks don't have any idea what a shooting board is, and even many who do are totally unaware of exactly how valuable one of these can be, even in a workshop full of power tools. By the end of this video, I'm willing to bet that you're going to be digging through your scrap bin ready to make your own shooting board, because you're about to see some clever ways that one of these can really up your woodworking game, even if you don't typically use hand tools. A shooting board is a jig that works in conjunction with a hand plane to dress and square up the edges and ends of work pieces, to fine tune a miter or other angled cut, and to micro adjust the length or the width of a project part with a level of precision that just can't be matched with power tools. Now, if you're looking at this hand plane and you're thinking, I don't like hand planes, so this one isn't for me, I urge you to just stick with me for a few more minutes because this isn't like anything you've ever done with a hand plane. What I'm going to show you is so easy that you're going to be digging out your old plane just to give this a try. Now let's start with making precise cross cuts. I try to keep my table saw well tuned, but as I make a cross cut, even the smallest shift of the board on the miter fence or a little bit of deflection away from the blade can produce an end that is slightly out of square. Now maybe that is good enough for some projects, but for your best work with your most expensive materials, these errors can add up through the course of a project. So good enough isn't always good enough, especially because it is so simple to take that workpiece you just cut at the table saw over to your shooting board and clean it up with a few quick passes across the end grain. Then saw marks, chip out, the tiniest inconsistencies all disappear and you have a board that is perfectly square, both on its face and on its end. And it'll have a finished surface that doesn't even need sanding. Of course, whether you're using a table saw or a shooting board, it's impossible to get a square end if the reference edge isn't straight along its length. A shooting board can take care of that as well. In this case, I'm not so worried about the end being square yet. In fact, if the board is narrow, it would be impossible to reference off the shooting board's fence. My only concern is straightening that edge, and that means keeping it against the sole of my plane. So as I apply pressure along the opposite edge, I follow the plane down the length of the board with my hand. This is really, I think, the easiest way to edge joint a small or even medium-sized workpiece, even for just glue-ups, because I'm not only making it straight, but the shooting board jig itself ensures that that edge is going to be made perfectly square to the face of the board, and I'm not going to have ripples or tool marks that I'd get from a power joiner, and I can work with smaller stock than I can safely do with a power joiner. Now that that reference edge is straight, I can place it against the fence on the shooting board, and then it'll be nice and secure as I square the end just as I showed you before. Sometimes though, you may not want the end to be perfectly square. One of the greatest advantages of a shooting board is the ability to precisely fit projects to the spaces they have to go in, and sometimes that means tweaking your angles a little bit. A good way to do this is to slip a feeler gauge between the board and the fence to use as the tiniest of shims. This throws the cutting angle off just a little bit and the end will come out slightly out of square. I like to start with just a small adjustment and then add shims to work my way up to a perfect fit. As you make adjustments to the end of a workpiece, the board will obviously get shorter. So there is a process to use the shooting board to fit parts effectively. Typically, if I'm working on something that has to be really precise, and I know I'm going to use a shooting board to get that precision. I'll cut my workpiece a little longer than it needs to be at the table saw. Then I'm going to use the shooting board to fine tune its size and shape. For example, if I need this project part to be 13 inches long, I'm going to cut it at the table saw to about 13 and a quarter or so. Then I'll take the shooting board and I'll square up one end. Next, I'll measure 13 inches from that clean end and mark it with a fine pencil, or better yet, a knife. I may even skip the measuring, and if possible, I'll hold my project part right up to the assembly, and then I'll mark it in place so I get it precise as it's going to fit in the project. Now, I could try to cut right to that line with the table saw, but as I've already demonstrated, the shooting board will give me a cleaner, more precise cut, and it's gonna better allow me to gradually sneak up on that line 
as I custom fit the part into its spot in the project. So I'll just trim close to my line with the saw. That leaves a tiny bit to remove at the shooting board. Then I'll take a couple passes with the plane and then check my fit. If the part's still too long or too tight, I can plane more away. Since the plane can remove the tiniest amount while keeping that edge square and free of tool marks, it becomes a lot easier to sneak up on that perfect fit than it is with any other power tool. Now let me show you another little trick that may make you want to use your marking knife more. As your plane gets closer to a knife scribed line, the surface fibers on the waist side of that line start to chip away. That leaves a fine gap between the line and the sole of the plane. It's easy to see as that gap gets narrower with each pass until it disappears. At that point, you stop planing and you'll find yourself with a perfectly trimmed board. One of the problems that comes with cutting end grain, whether it be at a table saw or with a plane, is the chance of chipping out that corner where the cutter exits the wood. Here's a clever technique to avoid that. I'll flip my board so the finished edge that was against the fence is now my leading edge. Then I'll slightly angle the board away from the fence and take a few cuts on just the corner. This creates a small chamfer. And as I flip that edge back to the fence, you can see there's a little gap where that chamfered corner touches the sole of the plane. If I stop planing the end grain, just as that gap disappears, I'll eliminate the risk of chip out and get a crisp corner every time. That same chamfer idea also can be used to check that your plane iron is parallel to the sole of your plane, something that's important if you're shooting boards to work correctly. After taking a few passes on the corners before, I look at the end grain. If the transition between the angles is straight across the end, the blade is properly adjusted. If it's not straight, make use of the plane's lateral adjustment lever beneath the iron until it is. Now let's talk about the plane itself for a minute. The side of the plane that lays on the shooting board has to be square to the sole of the plane. So as it lays on the board, I should see no light between it and my square. If your plane is slightly out of square, you can compensate for that by canting the iron in the throat by using your lateral adjustment lever. But then it's gonna be out of alignment when you wanna use the plane apart from the shooting board. So if possible, I would dedicate a plane that needs that type of adjustment to the shooting board so I don't have to adjust it back and forth if I'm using it for something else. You can also try to correct your plane by sanding on the side. There are videos and tutorials out there if you wanna check into that. I've learned a lot about shooting boards over the years from Rob Cosman, and I agree with him that the best plane for the purpose is the five and a half. In fact, the five and a half may be the best all around bench plane for the whole workshop. Mine is a Wood River, which is a great value in planes because of the quality for the price. And you can still find Stanley's on eBay and elsewhere. I like the, the five and a half for its extra size on the side and its extra length. That helps it to ride on the shooting board a little bit easier. I especially like the extra space on the toe ahead of the cutter. This allows the plane to be in contact with the edge or end of the workpiece longer as I ramp up a little speed to start my cut. But you don't have to have a five and a half. The more common number five jack plane will work as well. Even a number four smoother. I've even used a block plane on a shooting board. Whatever you have, as long as it is razor sharp. I also really like Rob's shooting board designs. He makes them in four different sizes, from compact and convenient for small work with a block plane, to medium and large for regular project parts. There's even one for fine tuning 45 degree miters. If I were to choose just one, I think it may be the medium size 18 inch, but it's hard to choose because they all have their place on my bench. Rob uses a special lamination process that prevents the glue line from pulling and creating a bow in the base panel. It's really clever and it ensures a flatter, better functioning board. He and his family make these in his workshop in Canada. And you can buy them pre-made or you can make your own from scraps you have in your own shop because Rob has been generous enough to make some free videos to show you how to do that. I'm gonna to link to those below. Rob is one of the finest woodworkers I know, and he uses a shooting board in pretty much every project, even when he's using power tools. They're such versatile and important tools. It's a real shame that more woodworkers don't take advantage of them. 
I hope this video helps you to consider the possibilities because a shooting board can really up your woodworking game too. Now check this out. This is a Koenigsegg, Sweden's finest sports car. This is a Joburgs, Sweden's finest workbench. There are things for people who appreciate quality and high performance, something they can pass down to their grandkids' grandkids. You can't afford this, but this will cost you less than a good cabinet saw. Check out what Showbricks has to offer at the link below this video.